I may deal with a complex story, but I don't uh, deal in the way most of you are doing because I'm coming from humanities, from a very specific form of uh, research, dealing with something which is well known, but in a very simplistic manner named Kabbalah. Today everyone knows what Kabbalah is, but it's very simple. I try to do it in a more complex way, and I shall try to explain what's complexity in the case of my studies, which may be or not similar to what you are doing. So without knowing that uh, the conference attempted to find definitions of complexity, I offered mine, which has to do, hopefully, with what I am doing. So according to the way I attempted to summarize complexity in the context of studying the system I'm going to dis discuss, Complexity has to do with an accumulation of multiple embedded systems in transient or transitory frameworks. So I shall explain term after term. Hopefully you will understand. I'll understand the U2. Form first accumulation it has to do with the idea of diachronic. The systems which belong to the literature named Kabbalah, or Jewish mysticism, are a variety of different systems which occurred during time. But what is very important to point out is the fact that those systems remained legitimate forms of Kabbalah. I mean, we don't have the idea of a system becoming obsolete, and that's why it's forgotten, or disappeared from the horizon of the Kabbalist, but in a way, Kabbalah retained all the systems as part of its vast literature, even if they were conceived to be, from time to time, relatively simple. So the accumulation has to do with this diachronic characteristic of Kabbalah, that it retains, in fact, all the systems that emerged during its history. So we have a complexity which is related to the fact that not one single system is dominant, but in a way or another, the Kabbalists are looking to what I would call a panorama of all its history as legitimate. And that's why after one millennium of the development of Kabbalistic systems, we have a huge panorama, which is naturally very complex for reasons I shall discuss in a moment. So that is accumulation, which is not only a matter of Kabbalah, it's a matter of Judaism in general, and of any traditional society, that it attempts, in fact, to keep a variety of modes of thinking which emerged in the past, but because of the canonical status of those ways of thinking, they are conceived to be canonical. So Kabbalah, as Judaism in general, believes that the Bible is not obsolete, and rabbinic literature is not obsolete, and all the Kabbalistic systems which emerged in the Middle Ages not obsolete even in the 20th century. That is a complexity because people don't say that they are ju just there or legitimate, but they attempt to make sense of the complexity of different systems in a system which becomes more and more difficult to understand because it attempts to encompass as much as possible from the past. So we have a vast literature. We don't know how many books, maybe 10,000, maybe 20,000 books, which demonstrate, in fact, the openness that I'm going to discuss in a moment of Kabbalists in each and every generation to a variety of other systems of thought and that I'm going to discuss separately. So that is the accumulation, which has to do with the belief that there is nothing like one single system which is dominant now, 
and we can forget about the others as belonging to an interesting history, but no more than history. So from this point of view, the Kabbalists are not interested in history in a Hegelian way, but for them, history is basically tradition, and whatever happened in the past is conceived to be part of the heritage. More difficult is to explain the other part of my description, multiple embedded systems. Each Kabbalistic system has its own history. Kabbalistic systems emerge in different continents and different contexts, religious, political, economical, and social, and there were interactions this is why we have such a big ramification of different Kabbalistic systems. It's not only a matter of original thinking of different authors, but the fact that they operated in different circumstances, in different times, I'm going to explain in a moment, created the diversity. To give you examples, Early Kabbalistic systems emerged in southern France in the end of 12th century, moved to Spain in 13th century. At the end of the same century, different forms of Kabbalah are moving to northern Africa, Italy, Germany, Byzantine Empire, and land of Israel. Those are totally different forms of context. One Catholic, the other one Muslim, the third one, the Byzantine Empire, is Christian Orthodox, and so on. So the Kabbalists are operating in circumstances which are dramatically different, and that's what I call embedded in. This embedment should be explained because it is in itself very complex. We're speaking about a very small Jewish minority acting in majority cultures which were very creative and powerful. What is the relationship between a minority culture and a majority one? It's very simple to speak about the influence of the majority culture on the minority one, and that is true. However, in examples I'm going to bring, the situation is much more complicated. For example, the peak of Kabbalistic literature, written in Castile, end of 13th century, can be understood as part of a very powerful European Renaissance or cultural renaissance related to the king of Castile, Alfonso Sabio, or the wise. So here we have a very strong cultural context and Kabbalah, some few Kabbalists acting in Toledo and in the environment of Toledo were influenced by this cultural renaissance. However, to speak about minority and majority in this case is very difficult because a nice part of the cultural renaissance is due to translations made from Arabic into Castilian and Latin by Jews. So the Kabbalists, who are a small minority, were living together with the translators in the same small ghetto of Toledo, neighbors. So the idea of a majority culture, independent, created by others and consumed passively by a minority doesn't work in this case as in many other cases. So in fact, we don't have an external system articulated, strong, independent of the minority system. But in fact, the two systems are developing parallelly in a way or another as act forms of activities of the same minority living together in the same Huderia or place of the Jews 
a neighborhood not far away from the court of the king. So the idea that we have an embedded minority is true. But it's not so simple that all the time the Kabbalists are consuming ideas coming from outside and importing them artificially. But in a way, we have a much more reciprocal form of exchange, which complicates the understanding. It will be much easier would we have an external system that we can check what was taken from there into the minority system, but that's not the case. To take another example, maybe you heard about the Italian Renaissance. It's a powerful cultural development. Florence, capital of Europe, created, in fact, a culture which imposed itself in Europe. Kabbalists created there in Florence. Were they influenced by the Italian Renaissance? The answer is yes and no. Yes, for sure. They were there and they knew Latin. They knew the major figures of the Renaissance. However, they were also their teachers. So it's not so simple to decide who took from whom. Because we have good evidence, which unfortunately still not estimated enough, that phenomena like Christian Kabbalah emerged exactly in the same place, under the guidance, if you like, of Jewish Kabbalists. So the interaction, the embedment of Kabbalah is not an artificial minority culture consuming the majority strong cultural system, but in fact it's much more interactive. So embedment means that the minority in, in fact is a minority, but it is much more influential than we can assume from the very beginning. And I can go on giving other examples in which major moments in the history of the Kabbalistic systems are not just a certain form of appropriation to borrow something from outside, but it's much more interactive. Let me attempt to bring an extreme form of embedment. Until now, I gave examples of Kabbalistic systems emerging in a certain city, which was the capital of very powerful in its cultural production. And that is a simple case of historical observation. The neighbor was there, powerful, giving money to the Kabbalists to be taught or to translate or whatever. However, in my opinion, embedment is much more vast or broad. To give you an example, Kabbalah in Western Europe is influenced dramatically by an historical event which has nothing to do with Kabbalah prima facie, which is the invasion of the Mongols in the East. You can say, really, Kabbalah almost never mentioned Mongols. Why should the Mongols in Russia or in Syria have an impact? on a system emerging in Western Europe? The answer is relatively simple. Mongols were able to defeat the Christians. For the Jews, the defeat of the Christians is the beginning of redemption. Out of the blue, rumors dealing with what happened a thousand miles far away from there created a certain form of expectations, aspirations, hopes of redemption, which change the nature of Kabbalah. That is embedment, not always in what happens in the small perimeter of a certain capital or even a certain empire, but things which happen far away, which prima facie people wouldn't relate at all. So that's the complexity which assumes that the Kabbalists were not only consuming the culture in which they were born, the Jewish culture, or the culture of their neighbors, but in fact 
had some form of vision, maybe very distorted, of international affairs. So, for example, Kabbalists attempted to check who are those Mongols. And one of them traveled to check me, are they really the lost tribes who are going to rescue us? And he studied Mongolian, it appears. So here an example of someone born in Saragossa, going to the east, attempting to check is really the invasion, the beginning of the end? And should we create in another way if we are in the time of the Messiah? So that's the embedment has to do not just with majority cultures, but it's much more reciprocal and dealing with a variety of events, only a few of them being taken in consideration in scholarship for the time being. That is true also in other cases, and here I shall bring a bizarre example for most of you, I assume. One of the most important developments in Jewish mysticism took place in mid-18th century in Ukraine, what's called Hasidism. You may be heard about Hasidism. It started in the Carpathians in mid-18th century. Exactly at the same time, in the same places, geographically, we have, again, a re religious renaissance, which is called Hezichas, which Christian Pravoslav mysticism became very powerful in a certain moment, in the same very places where Hasidism emerged. We can assume that the small minority consumed a phenomenon which took place in the neighborhood of the Carpathians, which may be true. Everything is complicated in the moment. We learn that the reformator of this new Christian mystical movement was of Jewish origin, as he admits himself. So what do we speak about? Who is the majority and who is the minority? Are we so sure that always the minority is the consumer or the producer? So those are examples of complexities related to embedment. As a minority, the Kabbalists were much more open or had to deal with cultures which were in their surrounding, while the minority, uh, the majority was less interested in it. And from many, times of, uh, many points of view, the majority culture is much more simplistic. Now, that explains also the last part of my definition, transient frameworks. For a literature written in the period of one millennium, in so many places, we don't have only a certain form of inner systemic development, an explication of assumptions which are found in earlier formulations and explicated with the time by later thinkers, but the fact that the, the Kabbalists had to move of their own will, or because they were persecuted, or because they were expelled, created, in fact, new circumstances for the development of Kabbalah. And those new circumstances created changes in their system. I shall give a major example. In 1492, not only America was discovered. Also, Spain became clean of Jews. All the Jews were expelled from Spain. Spain was the center of Kabbalah until 1492. In one single year, a small group of Kabbalists had to spread in all the Mediterranean. People arriving without anything. Everything was remained in Spain. In new centers, Northern Africa, Italy, Ottoman Empire, Constantinople, 
Those Kabbalists arrive without anything, and the only way to receive a job or a position as a rabbi is to write, to show that someone knows something that all the others don't know. And we have in one generation an incredible renaissance of Kabbalistic literature written in all the major centers in the Mediterranean uh, area, in which the Kabbalist had to demonstrate to different people, to different cultures, that they have something that the other don't have, which means an interaction between people who were living in one single framework, Spain, the Catholic Spain, with other forms of cultures, like Northern Africa, Muslim, or the Italy of the Renaissance, or the Ottoman Empire, all of them different centers. And in fact, those tra transient frameworks push the Kabbalists to create in new forms in order to be able to have access to power or to positions in the new centers. So from this point of view, the Kabbalist did not only attempt to explicate earlier systems in more complex ways in new places, but they had to compete with and to attempt actually to excel in places in which no one heard about what is called Kabbalah, and now they had to demonstrate their vision. Now, we can describe the history of this vast literature using the term panorama. Since all those books, at the beginning in manuscripts, later on in print, were conceived to be canonical, all of them were at the disposition of later masters. And they had to coordinate or to attempt to find correspondences between systems which emerged in so many places. And from this point of view, the history of Kabbalah is the history of creating more and more complex systems. Almost every system which appeared is more complex than the others because it had to take in consideration the later developments and to find correspondences or affinities in a variety of ways. One form of complexity is to assume that we have hierarchy. All the systems are good, but there is something higher and something lower. To build up what is higher, what is lower, is a certain form of complex thinking. Another way is to say that systems which appear to be different, and were indeed different, are really not different, because you can find the common denominator, which is not explicit in the different systems, but a later Kabbalist is able according to his view, to see the common denominator, which is not written, not obvious, in the books uh, he's uh, reading. So from, his point, from this point of view, we have a long history, one millennium. We have geographical diversity, which is relatively, how to put it, broad. We can speak from India or there were some Kabbalists also, up to Los Angeles of today. That is the area in which Kabbalists of a variety of forms are creating. And necessarily, we have a diversity which is, in my opinion, not only the result of enrichment, but the later systems, 20th century systems for Kabbalah are much more complex than the other systems uh, I'm acquainted with. So here we have, in fact, a way of thinking in which complexity is part and parcel of the development of 
the Kabbalistic systems, which by enriching themselves, uh, they are working with a diachronical axis, while uh, they are creating systems that for them are synchronic. They are taking in consideration all what is found as if they are part of one single panorama. But the diachronical issue, meaning the merging and history of a variety of different systems, is a factor which creates the complexity which is afterwards translated by the Kabbalist who are reading all the different books as if they are belonging to one superior, broader, more profound, esoteric system which they are attempting to develop generation after generation. I don't know if such a reading is similar to the ways in which in different forms of precise sciences you are confronting. I assume that you are working with systems which are relatively synchronic. They are found in before you, and you attempt to understand what happens there with, without attempting to deal with what can be called from your point of view obsolete phenomena, which belong to history, that are recognized as no more valuable, and you can get rid of them. What is characteristic in a traditional form of thinking is the fact that you cannot get, uh, you cannot erase, in fact, the past, even if, from some point of view, people would assume that it is already not working in new circumstances. For the Kabbalist, there was no real problem of predictability. I Means their systems were conceived to work by the dint of tradition. It works today because it worked yesterday and it should work in, in the future. I Means they didn't attempt to predict because they were certain that what they are doing is working and shouldn't or there is no reason to check what happens. However, predictability is very important for scholarship of Kabbalah. For example, if we find a manuscript which is anonymous, I should be able to demonstrate who wrote this manuscript by understanding the system and being able to see if this system is found there and to predict in a way who is the author by a certain knowledge of the history and the specificity of each of the systems. So in a way, the Kabbalists, so they were less philo philosophically oriented and much more related to performance of the rabbinic commandments. They were not interested to check if their system is working. So it was for them much easier to build more complex systems which were not necessarily checked by a reality test. Nevertheless, scholarship should try to work with a reality test when attempting to identify the different developments or anonymous books and take in consideration that some specific characteristics are unique to a certain period and can help us understand the emergence of a certain system in a certain specific setting. So, in addition to all those complications, historical, cultural, geographical, the research of Kabbalah, like any other forms of mysticism, is complicated by what can be called the idiosyncrasy of the Kabbalist. When someone is found in a situation that he has a panorama 
of thousands of different books. The choice has to do with idiosyncratic inclination of a certain Kabbalist. Meaning, emotional, intellectual propensities, which pushes one Kabbalist to put in relief one form of system, or put on the pedestal another form of system. So here, in fact, the search of Jewish mysticism has to enter also processes related to psychology in, in which decisions to go in one direction or another are not only dictated by external elements, but also by inner tensions or problems or inclinations or interest. So from this point of view, the development of Kabbalah is impredictable. It's not only a matter of a new circumstance adding one new element that can be put you know, in the vast picture. From many points of view, no one can predict what is going to be the next development given the fact that the spatial character of the new Kabbalist is part and parcel of the structure the system will take in the future. So we have a certain vision of, for the Kabbalist, a closed system. Doesn't matter how com complex it is. However, looking to Kabbalah from outside, we can see a very interesting example of open knowledge. It's open knowledge depending on what is going on on the market, intellectual or other, also economical. Have a look to what happens in Los Angeles. You'll see how the money of the stars are changing Kabbalah simply. And that is this open knowledge is really unpredictable, not only because of the characters of the Kabbalists, but also of the new audiences entering the consummation of Kabbalah. So I hope that I gave you the impression, not, not of a small complex system or a big complex system, but a system which is open-ended and changing itself almost all the time given the new continents, maybe in a while we we'll speak about the new planets in which the Kabbalah is operating. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Uh, yes, uh, do you have any idea of the possible relations between what happened in France, in the south of France, in Lunel, and, uh, and the Qatar movement, uh, which is about the same time, and uh, which is in the same area? I can you raise your voice? Uh... Um, <clears throat> do you have any idea of the possible relations yes. between the Qatar movement oh and the beginning of so-called modern Kabbalah in the south of France at about the same time? Uh, as I mentioned, the Kabbalah emerged at the end of the 12th century in southern France, a province in which uh, heretical movement, heretical from the point of view of the Catholics, was widespread and from many points of view was even majority form of religion. So there's no doubt that Jews and also Kabbalists coexisted and must have some form of relationship with the Qatars. However, even if there was a, co a contact and an impact of the Qatars on the Kabbalists, the Kabbalists were very, very careful not to mention because for a small minority, like the Jews, who are endangered in any case by the Inquisition, 
to have relationship with other heretics will be a double heresy. So, my answer is, plausibly there were relationship. Formally, in the Kabbalistic book, there, are, there is no relationship. And the answer is very simple. Because to mention something like that is to endanger the Kabbalistic books of being heretical. As you may know, the famous story of the Crusaders who were sent to purge southern France of the Qatars. I believe it was in Montpellier, when the order was kill everyone. God will select who was, go, who was the heretic and who not. So you can imagine that the Jews would enter in a relationship with heretics that were so absolutely exterminated. So here we have a problem of being cautious. And even if you have a relation, to hide it. Okay. Yes. To say yes. That most, I think I understood you to say that mostly what we scientists are doing here yes. is using knowledge synchronously yes. at our same time. Yes. But actually, there was a huge amount of knowledge, knowledge activity, yes. centuries beforehand. Yes. And it, that was a sort of throwaway remark. I mean, I wondered whether you have some idea about how we should use knowledge of previous times. I can only give you one example. One of the perhaps pioneers of complex systems was my great uncle, Lewis Fry Richardson, L.F. Richardson. And he made this, he studied power laws uh, in the long ago. And he looked at the study, the statistics of deadly quarrels. And he used statistics, of course, of conflicts going right back many, many centuries to demonstrate that human, human uh, propensity to have fights uh, goes right, right back in, in time. Yeah. But do you think that there are other ways that we should be looking at history to understand our modern society yeah. in a scientific way? Yes. Uh, I can answer from here, yes. So, from your example, we must, distinguish, we must distinguish between two different things. One, the material, which is old, is used using a new methodology of statistics. For sure, you can use earlier data by applying a new approach. However, you wouldn't say that Pythagoras or Newton should be part and parcel, even if they are wrong of your picture of the world. So, the approach of the past is conceived to be obsolete now, despite the fact we can use the data from a statistic point of view. For the Kabbalist, it's not only the data which was conceived to be legitimate, but also the approach. From this point of view, I assume that you are working with an assumption that what is later is more precise, more refined, more sophisticated, and there is no reason to study at the same time systems which are not unblocked today. But you can use them as part of statistics. So I would say that uh, the progress of science is eliminating all the time major parts of the past. Why for the Kabbalists to eliminate the past was conceived to be illegitimate. So really I don't have any good recommendation. I am dealing with the old systems because they were conceived to be all the time relevant. But I wouldn't recommend something like that, but to people who are dealing with history of science, which is just an historical approach. 
Uh, I, I think that the, there is an aspect uh, which, uh, which uh, is important in what you are saying. Uh, the natural sciences uh, for a very long uh, time, especially physics, uh, uh, had this com uh, concept of Markovian dynamics. Markovian means that what happens in the next second depends only on the state of the universe right now and not of the state of the universe before, whatever is it's relevant from the uh, state of the universe before is supposed to be already included in the state of the universe today. This is uh, at the mechanical level, at the very elementary particles is always true. However, it seems to me that it's a very important observation that that's exactly the, the difference between the physical uh, listic systems and all the others which do have a memory. Uh, uh, cultures do have a memory, something uh, in bio, even in biology, some, uh, f the fact that uh, an organism underwent in the past a certain event, it's still preserved. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so this, uh, this uh, distinguishing between uh, the Markovian property and, uh, and the systems which, uh, which have a memory, I think it's very important and it's very, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, indicating, in fact, another uh, aspect of how complex uh, the systems are. Maybe in a sense it might be a candidate to a definition of complexity. Systems which, uh, which are not Markovian, systems which, uh, in which the present state is not completely defining. But another uh, uh, thing which uh, uh, I come out uh, from here, it's uh, uh, in a sense I would start uh, 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 jokingly that uh, apparently the publish or perish uh, uh, thing was uh, was very active at those times as today. Uh, uh, what what is uh, what is uh, more interesting is that uh, and it maybe should uh, influence our uh, funding policies. Apparently, from what you were telling, more you were in the parish. Uh, uh, in the parish danger, more you were publishing. So maybe, uh, in fact, our uh, uh, claim that having tenure positions uh, is increasing our productivity, uh, maybe it's a fallacy. And in fact, um, some of us... Uh, 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 um, um, another uh, uh, aspect which you pointed out... a question out. or a comment? No, these are comments, of course. Uh, 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 there, there is uh, this uh, idiosyncratic, uh, uh, what, you, what you call this idiosyncratic way of looking to the world. This is actually common to how scientists do, especially in the field where I come from. Uh, in, uh, there is this grand unification dreams. And in fact, all of us, uh, I mean, some, in, in certain fields, this, this concept of putting everything around a, a single principle is a driving force. Probably it's even something very interesting in human, so I took too much time. Uh, uh, it, these are half questions. I mean, I would like to have your... Re uh. Uh, look, you use the term memory. Memory, in the way you used it, is different from cultural memory. You are speaking basically about factors which are found today, were in the past, but they enter a certain form of biolo biological system. So we are using the term memory in order to describe the presence of something, an experience from the past in the present. That is an automatical memory. With traditional systems, this memory is selective, depending on, on the propensity of a certain intellect. While in the way you are presenting it, that's biology, which is in a way incorporating elements found in the past. There is actually no conscious selection. There is a selection for sure of the past, but it's not a conscious one. In traditional systems, there is a conscious selection even if you believe that everything is fine. You must select something. You cannot have everything in one book. About publish and perish, I don't, cannot recommend here what to do. For sure, not to perish. But uh, in this context, I would say, if the Kabbalists were condemned to perish by the Inquisition, 
So their way to survive was to publish. So that's my simple reaction to what happened there. Their way to survive was to publish, like an academy. And they did it very nicely. In one generation, all the Mediterranean was basically Sephardi or Spanish. Okay, so thank you very much.